And it is a particular pleasure welcoming um, now to the stage Corinna Kreza. Um, she is an expert not only on artificial intelligence issues, but also government issues, administration issues. Um, and um, you can tell us a lot what we need to improve with regard to administration, good administration um, and innovation. Um, she is um, Senior Managing Director and part of the Managing Board of Accenture ASG, and that is Austria, Switzerland and Germany, not Australia, <laughs> this is why, why um, I took extra care with Accenture. And um, I have to say, um, I always loved working um, with Accenture when I was uh, still at BI um, and responsible for, for the Business 20, um, Accenture was one of the leading forces in also bringing gender um, issues um, onto <laughs> gender gap issues um, and diversity issues into the equation. Um, and, uh, and you did some wonderful work on the international um, scene. And now they are wonderful work in supporting us in the Artificial Intelligence Conference. Um, thank you so very, very much. Um, we will hear a kickoff talk, um, first by you, but then we will also have a discussion up here um, with a person you've already heard and seen this morning, Lars Zimmermann, um, and he's going to join us in, in a few minutes. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Always a little bit strange to stay in front, uh, to, to, to stand in front of a very um, empty room, but nevertheless, I hope we got many people out there who watch it um, online. So it's really a pleasure to speak here on the Aspen Conference. And once again, thank you for the warm welcome. And today it's about the future of public sector in Germany. And having in mind that just last week, the designated German government published the coalition agreement, there couldn't be a better time to talk about that. And indeed, if you look in the coalition agreement, uh, state modernization is center stage and there's a strong focus on digital transformation and innovation. We see a lot of bold ambitions, and it's really the time to get it right this time. If you look at it, there's a clear need for action, and I think we are all aware of the challenges we are facing. It's not only about managing the current pandemic, it's also about the need to achieve the UN development goals, and also not to forget, to really maintaining our competitiveness in an increasingly divided world. So Germany and Europe really needs to fight for the competitiveness in this space. So what do we need? We definitely need bold political decisions, but I think it's also clear that we also need a strong government and a strong public administration because to bring political decisions into action, we definitely need a strong public sector in Germany. If we look at the public sector and the public administration today, and we heard it today in the morning, I think Lars, you were also mentioning it, there's room for improvement. We need to act a bit differently. It's topics around user centricity. If you think about, for example, how applications for approval should happen to really make all the investments which are supposed to happen in the near future when, when it comes to climate change and so on. If we really want to have it as a kind of impact, these processes need to change, need to manage subsidies in a different way. And we also need to make sure that project management happens in a more professional manner to really deliver reliable results. So overall, we definitely need creative solutions and we need to leverage new technologies. And if you bring it together, it's about really having applied innovation in the public sector. If you look at where we are starting at, it's not very impressive compared to other states where Germany currently stands. We are far behind our aspiration level as a fourth largest national economy. But if you look at scores like, for example, the DESI index, the European index for digitization from 2021, 
Germany is number 16 out of 27. If we look at the um, e-government monitor from D21, which just recently got published, it, all, it also states that the state itself is progressing only slowly and lags far behind developments in business and private life. So why are we doing so slowly, so poorly compared to other states? I think there are a few reasons behind it, and I only want to cover some of them. One is definitely if you look at the German constitution, because our German constitution ensures departmental sovereignty. It's about federalism and local autonomy. And that's all for good reasons, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, it makes large-scale transformations if you want to do something cross-ministry or cross-level, definitely more difficult. And there are also soft factors which we need to take into account if we're talking about innovation in the public sector in Germany. So the German administrative culture is based on Max Weber, on his organizational sociological understanding. And according to Max Weber, bureaucracy is a formally most rational form of exercising power. But what does it mean? It's characterized by consistency, precision, tautness, and reliability. And all that together causes silo structures, which we see in many areas, risk avoidance, and definitely also a lack of um, error culture. Mehr Fortschritt wagen, dare for more progress. That's the theme of the designated new government, and this also needs to become true for the public administration. So if you want to make a difference, we definitely need change. So what needs to be changed to really bring out the potential of innovation in the public sector? I would like to cover four different areas. First of all, technology, culture and skills, new work, and governance. Let me start with technology and also to be very clear, also coming from a tech company, technology does not solve everything, but it's definitely an important basis. And when we are talking about digital governance, we definitely need a sovereign cloud. And this is not only about having any kind of infrastructure services and having a scalable infrastructure, it's much more also the basis for modern and flexible data management. And without modern and flexible data management, we will not be able to leverage AI in any way. It's also the platform for joint development and use of solutions. So it's not necessary that each and every agency does, it, oh, does his or her oh, its own kind of, of solution. And therefore, it is very important that we establish a sovereign platform which is used across all levels of government or public administration, so federal, state, and local. And the good thing is, if you look at the current cloud strategy of the public sector in Germany, it's hinting in that direction that the, the objective is really to have one joint platform for all three state levels. This leads to my second technology point. We also need a modern service architecture. And we see, we talk quite a bit about online Zugangsgesetz, the online access law, with that kind of einer für alle concept, one for all concept. I think that's something which we also need to apply for internal processes within the administration, within the government, to really make sure that we standardize and leverage synergies as far as possible to really speed up in, in bringing stuff forward. And finally, we definitely also need a digital identity, a digital identity for each and every citizen in Germany, which is safe, and which is easy to use. So much on technology, but as said, technology is not everything. Culture and skills are also very key levers. And I also mentioned, already mentioned the point around um, lack of error culture. If you look at the culture of public sector in Germany, it's pretty much around avoiding mistakes. And this is in quite a bit of a contradiction to innovation, because if you want to innovate, you also need to try out stuff. And you also need to take into account that you will fail. And 
fail fast. It's one of the themes of agile organizations. If I always want to make everything correct, I will not be innovative. So the public sector really needs to provide room for a culture where I can innovate, where it's allowed to make mistakes, where it's allowed to fail. And of course, experimentation clauses, agile ways of working, digital labs and so on are all levers to push that kind of innovation. But I think we also need to take or keep in mind that it also might need a bit of change in the way media looks at public sector and the way how fairs are covered in media. And we also might need to rethink the way that the Court of Auditors is currently acting when it comes to public sector pro uh, projects. Besides culture, of course, it's also about skills. And this will definitely not be a one-off exercise. And it's not only about training IT people in the latest technologies. It's about basic technical skills for each and everybody in the public sector. It's about not only having an IQ, but also having a TQ, a technology quotient, which is needed. Because if, when we are talking about innovation, digitization, we need both sides. We need the IT side, but we also need the functional experts. So it's about new technologies, new methodologies, new ways of working, and this will never, never stop. It's going to be an ongoing process. So we had technology, culture, and skills. Let's talk about new work, because new culture and skills will only have an impact if they're applied in the day-to-day -day work. Therefore, the organizational framework and prerequisites need to be changed as well. What do I mean by this? We need to think about work location, we need to think about career paths, we need to think about role requirements, we need to think about compensation, incentives, and so on, when we are talking about civil servants. And last but not least, I want to focus on the fourth area, the area of governance. So the right governance is a key lever for large-scale and speedy transformation of the entire government. And all of you probably followed quite a bit the discussion around, do we need a dedicated ministry for digitization, yes or no? From my perspective, it should not be about the question, do we need a ministry, yes or no? It is rather about the question, which governance really fuels a speedy digital transformation? And we did a study together with Professor Korte from the NRW School of Governance. And what we looked at is what does successful digital governance look like? So more precisely, we were interested if having a digital ministry would really improve our DAISY index in the near future. And so what we did, we analyzed the digital governance of three countries, which are quite far ahead in the DAISY index, so they are ranked high on the one hand side, and they improved quite a bit over the last years. And surprisingly, none of them got a ministry for digitization. But all of them definitely have governance structures in place, and they all have a central place, a central office, where the threats of digitization come together. And if you look at it a little bit closer, they have five aspects in common. First of all, that kind of central organizational hub, which got the mandate to really drive digitization. They got clear cross-level collaboration models, so it's absolutely clear who is responsible for what and how the interfaces work together. They got the right people and the right skills on board, not only a few, but enough of them. And, and I think that's also a key element, they got a clear budget responsibility how to spend money on what kind of projects to spend money and how to drive digitization forward. And they are also focusing on synergies for joint progress created through targeted knowledge ex exchange. So technology, culture, skills, new work and governance, all are key levers to drive innovation in the public sector and to make a real impact in the new way public administration brings political decisions into act action. With that, I want to stop here, and I would like to ask Lars on, on, on stage for a more detailed discussion on what can we change in terms of innovation in government.
So last, maybe we, we, we start with a short introduction of the GovTech campus. So you are one of the masterminds behind the GovTech campus. What kind of role, what kind of objective does the GovTech campus have when it comes to innovation in the public sector in Germany? First of all, thanks for having me and, and explaining what the GovTech campus does, who hasn't opened yet. So uh, we are in the last phase of uh, preparing the official opening. So it's basically about bringing external innovations to government and the public sector. So we believe that there's a great technology scene, not only in Germany, but also in Europe. And government and public sector um, can collaborate with these companies uh, to bring these solutions into government, to strengthen the tech scene. And then, of course, in the long run, uh, to provide what we are also you know, naming as the digital uh, sovereignty aspects. If you want to be sovereign on tech, you need to be able to have your own tech that you can use. And the best way to do it is strengthen the own tech scene, use your products and solutions. And bringing this together um, is the main mission of the GavTech campus. And, and, and what kind of concept do you have to really Im improve or, or mm -hmm. strengthen that kind of collaboration between the different parties, really play that kind of ecosystem? Yeah. First, it's a governance model, which is really pretty unique. So uh, we did great research globally and said, um, is this the first kind of GavTech campus of that kind? And we can say yes. Um, so basically, um, for the first time in Germany, um, the federal government, the lender, so which is the main regions uh, in uh, Germany, we have 16 of them, and in the long run, uh, also the city level. We have uh, uh, over 11,000 city governments in Germany, quite a lot. So the, the main question was, how can we bring them together in one institutional setting? And um, the GAFTA campus, for the first time, is where all these three layers can come together in this one entity, which is the GAFTA campus, which is pretty new. Um, but that's not enough. We said, um, OK, um, it doesn't make sense that only government is doing this. And it wouldn't also make sense if only the tech scene would provide something like this. So we said, why not trying it out and bringing the technology scene, the startup scene, the investors, the developers, the founders, the entrepreneurs together with these government layers? Let's also integrate the top research organizations on applied research, which is important. And um, of course, um, let's also bring in uh, the nonprofit um, um, agencies. There are a lot of nonprofits who do great stuff on you know, data security, who make up their minds about um, the sovereignty issue. So bringing the, what I say always say, bringing the best of breed together from the GovTech scene, um, providing them with that platform where they can actually um, co-ideate, co-create, and co-learn to, together. You just mentioned what you think has to be done. Um, and we said, OK, we need to build a platform where this is possible. And maybe as a last word, we don't do that only as a hybrid model or a mm -hmm. virtual model. Um, we felt like um, a good way to bring this GovTech scene together is also to provide a co-innovation space, so really a location uh, where government agencies can send their digital teams in, where startups will be, where investors will be, where civil society will be. So providing them with an opportunity to first of all, meet and see each other and know about each other. Um, and of course, Germany is a highly federalized country, so we organize the campus in a way that we will open not only a campus place in Berlin, which is pretty nice, um, we are also planning op opening up the GAFTA campus in other uh, lenders. Um, we started with Hamburg and Hesse, um, which are two very entrepreneurial kind of countries when it comes to um, digitizing of government, but we're also negotiating with many other Bundesländer. Yeah, and I had the opportunity to visit the location in Berlin, and I must say it's really impressive. It's really top-notch in, in, in terms of innovation space, and I think we're all looking forward when it's opened. <laughs> Everyone yeah. does. <laughs> OK. So, Lars, let's, let's get a little bit more in, in, into what we expect from the kind of next government. And um, I talk quite a bit about the prerequisites for, for innovation. Is there anything specific from your point of view what you would like to ask from the new government to really provide space to, to really drive innovation and bring mm -hmm. it forward? Well, the first thing, I think, is <clears throat> to understand that it's not about technology in the first place. So um, Germany loves to, about it, to talk about technology all the time. I like technology very much, but that's not 
the most important kind of stuff. Yeah. So you just mentioned it. Um, I think leadership is very important uh, and the organizational and the cultural issue is very yeah. important. So I don't want to say that you know, the outgoing government had no leadership behind it. Um, but I think that our focus was far too, um, you know, we, we focused too much on processes. Like we have a government service and it was very analog, so we digitized the service and now we have a digital government service. That's basic stuff. So um, it doesn't sound nice, but I also tell this to government officials, so it's just not blaming them here. Um, for example, what we do right now in Germany when it comes to digitizing the, the government services is pretty much nothing else than digitizing the past. Mm -hmm. Because what we actually do right now is what other countries did 10 years ago. So it's great that it's done and I'm quite sure in two, three, and four, five years we will have a very basic uh, kind of top-notch uh, digital services. But there's no addressing right now about what is the impact of artificial intelligence, um, what technologies can be used to make governments better, yeah. how do technologies change the way government is operating. So, and this is what we want to address. So how does it have to be? I think it's definitely necessary that we don't see digitizing of government like a procedural kind of thing, which is a nice to have. I think it's a strategic issue of any government in the future, because if democracies are not getting technological savvy, what I call it, I think they won't be able to survive. So that sounds very harsh, but if you have a look around the world, um, if you own technologies, if you are capable, we had the artificial intelligence aspect. Right now, if you look around the world, no government is artificial intelligence savvy. So all the um, all the skills, they are based in private companies. Mm. Um, and sooner or later, um, government will not be able to speed up with them. And of course, there will be then the question, who just owns the power of AI? And if you own the capability, you own pretty much of the value chain and you own pretty much of the things that you can do in the society. So leadership is important. And maybe as a second and last point, um, this is the organizational issue, um, not only in Germany, but especially in Europe. We have a thing that governments are pretty much organizing the way they have been organized 150 to 200 years ago. Prussia in Europe was very famous. We all like Prussia. They did a lot of great stuff when it came to renovating how a state is run. Um, but um, we are now in the same situation. So we have a federalism that has been invented at a time where uh, you know, nothing we use on a daily basis ever existed. Um, there was no internet, there was no iPhone, there was no platform business. Um, so I think it's time to, um, you know, j just ask the question, if we want to become a digital savvy government, to make government better, that's very important, right? Yeah. Um, what do we have to do to actually do it? And I think it should be time to think about, do we have to have a new uh, process to change the way federalism is working, what we call in Germany the Staatsreform, it's a big word, but I think it's definitely time to update federalism because the context right now that Germany has to operate in, like any other European government, also the US government, if you ask me, is completely different from what we had even 20 years ago. And um, I think especially the German federalism is not capable in, in addressing these issues the way it sh could be. And I don't want to make an argument to get rid of federalism. I'm a, I'm a big um, fan of the, the federalism way, um, but I think we have to adapt it to the technological context. And I think especially when we are talking about federalism, it's sometimes also used as an argument in, con in a context, in a technology context, where you wouldn't need to talk about federalism. Yes, You can find solutions of collaborations that yeah. keep the federalism. So. Absolutely. That's, I think, sometimes very easy excuse as well. Yeah, <laughs> some of I the agree. points. <laughs> so um, I guess you already also had a look in the new coalition agreement and the different initiatives, topics, ambitions which are in there. And when we get a new government in place, um, it's also about really realizing first achievements fast. So are there any kind of topics, initiatives, climate change, whatever, yeah. <laughs> where you would start if you would be in government to really demonstrate that they can deliver results which are tangible for, for the citizens? Yes, so the question is, will it happen? I don't know, but of course, I think on an organizational level, every ministry, for example, on federal level, but also on the lender level, um, they have all the requirements and prerequisites that they you know, need to change the way how a ministry is working. 
I know that this sounds a little bit ridiculous. The Germans here who, who know how German government system is working, it's not easy to change it, but they could immediately do it. So we have in Germany right now, so this huge debate about agility in government and government organization, and I like it and I think it's right. But um, too often we talk about this as a theoretical concept only. So it, when I you know, talk to government officials that, you know, take the first five processes in your ministry and make them agile and do it. Just not wait for anyone telling you that you have to do it, so just change it. And if it's just a very simple process. So I think it could have been done already, but there's a reason why they're not doing it, right? Because everyone waits for this grand strategy that someone says we will change it in whole, whole government. So the ownership about doing things by yourself without waiting for someone else is also a mindset and a cultural mm -hmm. issue that I think should be addressed. And that could be a quick win. I think what's great um, in the coalition agreement is that there will be, for the first time, a kind of a, this one single budget when it comes to um, digital projects. Um, I think that that will help to, uh, to, to make things a little bit quicker um, because it's clear where the, where the money comes from. And, if you work with government very often, um, the idea, everyone said it's a great idea, but the time that really is a little bit exhausting is um, watching the government to check where the money comes from. So that, mm. that, can, that can take years, right? So that will speed up the processes a little bit. Um, and I think um, digital identity is something that you also yeah. mentioned. I think that's really something where Germany has to speed up tremendously because without digital identities, you won't be able to digitize government. It's very simple. And I think the, the situation which we had with the digital identity is a perfect example of, of an error culture at the end. Absolutely. Because they yeah. tried it, they did it very fast, yeah. I think they did it they just could keep on and, and, and fix the issues. Absolutely, and there's another thing that yeah. I think um, gives us a lot of pressure, and that is that Apple, for example, a few months ago, they did an announcement saying um, that you can upload your ID in the wallet, so I think we all, most of us, uh, use um, Apple Pay. So, and uh, nine states in the United States uh, just agreed that the driver license can, you know, be uploaded in the wallet and you can uh, use that. Um, so, and this is for the first, really for the first time, where one of the big platform companies just moves into the GovTech scene because yeah. we all use Apple, the most of us, not everyone, but most of us. We have the hardware, they have the software, they have the brand, they have the design, and from one day to another, Apple moved into the GovTech scene. So um, if governments don't do it, companies like Apple will become huge, important players within the GovTech scene. My projection is that they will be already a yeah. big uh, player yeah. in this. Um, but this is something that a lot of government officials, I, I won't say that they don't understand it, but I think that they don't really um, want to you know, deal with that question, is that there is, there is competition for governments. A lot of governments believe there's no one else who can compete with us because we are the only government, right? But companies like Apple and Amazon and all the others, want, they, they are competing with government services, and that, of course, means that there will be competition for governments. Absolutely. Look at the Corona app. It's based Something on like Apple that. and Google right. <laughs> technology and, yeah, at the And end. we saw that also in the space issues. So the more, yeah. um, the, the, the more relevant private companies are because they have the capabilities, and it also is the same with the data issue, right? So just look into health tech. Um, if you want to analyze all, all health data, there are very. There are only companies who are capable in doing it, yeah. not a government organization. So, if the government wants to actually do it, they need to hire a company that has the people. They can pay the people much better than any government would ever pay them. Yeah. So, there is, you know, a shift of power because it's not about you know who owns the biggest armies, for example. If you have a technological capability that needs a lot of investment, it's very it's not easy for government to cope up, and that means that power is shifting to that kind of private organizations. Absolutely. Let's look at it from a different angle. You're an absolute expert in the startup scene. Is there anything which government could learn from the startup scene? <laughs> Yeah, well, yes and no, because <laughs> you can't really compare yeah. a government system with a startup organization. Completely course, agree. Yeah, yeah. But in, in terms of innovation, yes, agility, sure. being yeah. fast, trying stuff. <laughs> sure. So, um, I mean, there is this kind of risk thing. So, I think if you know that the risk is calculable for yourself 
every startup founder would take the risk, right? Saying, okay, there is a risk in everything, life is a risk, um, but we're just taking it because we feel like it's calculable for us. Government needs to have a 200% uh, insurance that is, will be working. And it's a little bit sarcastic because the government is waiting a long time to have this kind of 200% uh, uh, certainty. So the, the longer you wait, um, the, most li the more likely it is that it doesn't work, right? So having a little bit more this kind of risky attitude, it doesn't mean that government has you know, to spend money wherever it wants to. So it doesn't mean that you that you, sh you, that you sh shouldn't evaluate how risky the business is that you want to do. But I think you can learn from that. I think hiring processes are totally forgotten in government. Um, startups scale and grow because they are capable in hiring great talent. The yep. HR uh, perspective is very important. And there is a reason for that why the best people don't want to go to government. They go to a lot of startups because you know they have the working environment there, not only physically with nice offices, but also they just know they can grow, they can learn and all that stuff. That brings me to the last point, and you also mentioned it, um, the learning things, yeah. as a, um, what skills do you need to have? So we have 4.8 million people working in German public sector. Um, it's very likely that um, um, there will be a gap in talent also in the next 20 years because there's a shortage of talent um, and the public sector will experience it. So there is the need to skill up or to upskill um, the uh, um, uh, public administration people. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of you know, programs, but I think they don't address the tech issues properly. So there is one goal, and that would be also a wish for German government, just build the best education program for public administration when it comes to tech. To, um, uh, tech. There's no upskilling program right now from the German government to all the cities and all the lender, and that would be something very, very easy to actually do because you need to have a very skilled workforce. Absolutely agree, and, and I think it's really not only the IT people, it's around each it's and every... It's really everywhere. So we just experience it when we go out to Lender because of the campus. Um, yeah. So um, you have, and that's, that's a good thing in German government. So you can go to every city, you can go to every Bundesland, it's always a kind of the same. So you have CIOs, CDOs, you have the head of the HR department. So there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of people who have the same role and sales function. So you can easily do some kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning. So yeah. there are a lot of countries and a lot of lender and a lot of cities who do a great job and other cities can learn actually for them. So it's just like providing them a platform where they can actually do it and where they can reach out to the tech scene. So this is also what, what we want to do at the GAFTA campus. We want to bring best of breed content-wise to the campus, mm -hmm. create you know, skills, create um, the learning modules with them, and then provide it to everyone. Uh, one of the partners will be Stanford, the mm -hmm. um, Institute for Human-Centered uh, Human Artificial Intelligence. And we will work with Stanford to provide, for example, several courses when it comes to algorithms and what the impact to government. Perfect. I think we need to come to an end. <laughs> Um, so many thanks, Lars, for that very interesting conversation and discussion. And ladies and gentlemen, I think it's about waking up a sleeping giant, <laughs> which was the title of, of our <laughs> talk. And there's a lot of potential in the public sector, and I think we just have to harness it, bring it to the right governance, building the right structures, and then I think we can really turn into action. And with that, Thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening. And have fun with the rest of the Congress. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this was an excellent uh, panel. We don't have any time for questions right now. I'm really sorry because our next discussions and panelists are already waiting in the waiting room. Um, and our moderator is also already here. Um, we don't do a big break now. Just a few minutes uh, to get our moderator set up to um, get the stage set up and then we continue. But let me thank you so much again um, for
sharing your insight with us. Um, I want to make a connection between your panel and the next one and share a little anecdote with you. We talked about cybersecurity at another conference not long ago, a uh, panel discussion, and we talked about German federalism there um, as well. And if it's a good idea to have so many different agencies trying to take care of the security of cyberspace. And one of our panelists said, well, you know what? Resilience is also about redundancies and not giving too many access points. And I mean, who from the outside would really know who to attack with so, such a complicated system? And that's the first time that I heard that our complicated governance system was actually a part of building resilience. <laughs> so there's always two sides of the coin. Um, thank you so very much.